Nope. Awesome. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's time to get the afternoon session started. I'm Gabriel Pasquale, one of the content co-chairs. For our first session this afternoon, we have the fireside on crypto space regulation. So I'd like to welcome back to the stage Neha Narula, the director of the MIT Digital Currency Initiative, as well as Hester Peirce, the commissioner of, at the US Security Exchange and Commission. Uh, Hester Peirce was appointed to the SEC in 2018. Prior to joining the SEC, Commissioner Peirce conducted research on the regulation of financial markets at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. She was a senior counsel on the US Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, where she advised ranking member Richard Shelby and other members of the Committee on Securities Issues. Commissioner Peirce earned her bachelor's degree in economics from Case Washington Reserve University and her JD from Yale Law School. Welcome, Neha and Hester. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, ha uh, Commissioner Purse, thank you so much for being with us again. Um, I went back and rewatched the session that you had with Gary two years ago, uh, and it was uh, it was very interesting, um, and it was great to see the dynamic between you two. I don't know if you thought you know Gary would be in a position to to act on a lot of the things that you were talking about within the next few years potentially, but uh, it's interesting how things have played out. Um, so you know, I want to start by kind of looking back and uh, looking. You know, you were here two years ago in, in a different format, granted. Um, first of all, why do you come to the MIT Bitcoin Expo? I'm curious about why you want to attend and what you hope to get out of it. And second is I'm, I'm curious what you think is really changed. What's different now um, in, the, in the crypto assets landscape? Uh, what's changed over the last two years? Well, Neha, thank you for uh, having me and, and thanks for taking this time. It is a real honor to be here. I have to say my, my typical disclaimer, which is that my views represent my own views and not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. I like to come to, to this event because I think it represents a lot of talent in this space. And it's important for me to let you all know that I'm open to hearing from you. Um, you know, this virtual format is not the ideal for uh, interacting with, with people, but I, I still remember last time when I was done speaking, I had the chance to talk to, to a number of really interesting people. Um, and so I want to just extend the, my door is open message and, and let people know that they can come talk to me. Um, I, am, I am enthusiastic about, about um, what's coming and, and it does relate to the fact that, um, that we're likely to have a new chairman soon and that's likely to be Gary Gensler um, who, who was sharing the stage last time um, with me. And I think that Together, we'll be able to get some real, make some real progress in the crypto space. It requires the, the participation of the rest of the commission too. But because Gary is coming to the space with such a deep knowledge of crypto, um, I think that we'll be able to maybe take a little bit of a turn from where we've, where we've been and, uh, and, and build a better regulatory framework. So I'm quite optimistic about what's coming. And I would say that's kind of the biggest change is that we have an opportunity for a fresh start. I mean, frankly, since 2019, when I was, when I was uh, here before, not a lot has changed on the regulatory front. We're still waiting for a lot of the changes that we were talking about back then to happen. I think the biggest changes have actually been in the industry itself. We've had um, DeFi summer, which has been pretty dramatic to watch. I think it's lasted more than just the summer and we've seen um, an explosion of interest in Bitcoin um, from institutional players. And so there's there's definitely even more impetus for us to do something on the regulatory front. Yeah, the, the technology tends to move much, much faster than the regulation, unfortunately. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment, but I wanna pick up on this DeFi thing. DeFi kind of came out of nowhere out of the last two years. I mean, certainly, part of the draw for me into this space was the potential to do things like this. So it is very exciting to see. It also seems quite thorny for regulators to handle uh, what's going on. Um, you know, someone, a lawyer I talked to said, you know, deep high hasn't really hit regulation yet. Um, and, and that hasn't happened. So um, what are the challenges that this wave of projects brings to you at the SEC and how, I mean, what do you have for the developers who are, you know, charging ahead full speed in the DeFi space? Well, it is true. I think you, your friend was right that it that DeFi really hasn't hit the regulatory radar screen yet in this in 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 
one sense, I mean, of course, we're aware of it, but a lot of regulators are still very much focused only on Bitcoin and don't realize that there's a ton of stuff going on in DeFi and that people are trying to build this parallel financial system in DeFi. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening there. Um, it is a challenge because as a regulator, I, I do want to allow people the space to experiment with, with doing these kinds of things, but also want to caution people that you have to think about the securities law and other law legal implications of um, what you're building in DeFi. And so if you're building something that looks a lot like something in the CFI world, you want to think about whether, whether you better get some kind of regulatory um, approval before you move forward. And I know that's not a welcome message, but what I really want to avoid is having a situation where it, um, we saw the ICO boom in 2017, and then we saw down the road a bunch of enforcement actions coming out of that. And I and I want people to be thinking now about legal implications so that there aren't enforcement actions down the road. Yeah, I think that was yeah. an important lesson that I learned. Um, you know, I saw what was happening in 2017, and I I was sort of scratching my head as a non-regulator expert. Like this kind of looks like a secure. Like according to this definition, I don't see how these things go together. And uh, you know, what I learned was that the uh, the SEC takes its time. The wheels move slowly, but uh, they move. They will eventually move. They will be there. So um, you know, I think that's good advice to uh, developers. Um, you know, just just kind of related to that. Uh, as a developer myself, one thing I worry about is um, being held responsible for code that I write that I might not even, I might not be even running a service necessarily, right? I just write some software and I put it on the internet and um, somebody else runs it and uses it. But uh, I think, I think you know, something that's going to be challenging coming up lately is sort of walking that line between the people who are writing the code and, and you know, the infrastructure that's running this code that, that where the developer might not even be involved anymore. Neha, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's such an important issue for us to be talking about now. Um, I'm concerned that regulators who always want to have a central party to grab hold of when there isn't a central party there to grab hold of are going to say, well, who is it who wrote that code? And they're going to go after the person who wrote the code. And it's one thing to say, if you know, you're writing the code and you're running it yourself and you have um, an illegal um, mindset in, in using that code, but it's another if you put the code out there and other people use it to do things um, that you have no control over. So I think it's really important. Um, it's a really important issue. And it's one that I think those of you who are developers who are the, writing the code are going to have to educate us regulators um, to really help us see why it can be very chilling if we start bringing enforcement actions against the wrong people here. We will keep that in mind. That's good advice. Um, yeah, speaking of sort of trying to understand and walk this line, uh, you proposed um, a regulatory safe harbor and have been, I think, making updates to that proposal. Uh, I wonder if for the audience, for those who might not have, have heard about it, could you would you mind summarizing a little bit of it and maybe talking about what kinds of updates you're thinking about making to it? Yes, yeah, so the safe harbor was intended to be a response to people who came and said to me, I don't know how to do a token distribution event without it being treated as a securities offering. Um, I mean, you could do something like the what happened with Bitcoin, which was a very organic launch, but that's not sort of how most people are, are thinking about it now who are doing, you know, say, get venture capital funding at the beginning and then want to go out and get the network going and want to get those tokens widely distributed. So the idea was let people have a three-year period within which we're not going to try to make an assessment of whether or not these are going to be treated as securities. And instead, you, you require certain disclosures so that token purchasers know what, in, what, what the development team is thinking. Um, and those disclosures are subject to the anti-fraud laws under the securities laws. But beyond that, you, the tokens can move freely and you don't have to think about that. Um, and then at the end of the three years, we figure that it's likely that the network will be decentralized or the token will be functional. And so there aren't going to be these same kinds of questions about whether the movements of the tokens should be treated as securities transactions. Um, and so we're working on, a, on an update to that, which I, I hope to have out in a couple weeks. And that's one of the things that um, 
if, if Chairman Gensler gets confirmed soon, as I anticipate will happen, um, I, I expect to be presenting that to him and saying, hey, you know, let's try to do something like this. If not this, then maybe there's some other option that we could do to address these kinds of concerns that these projects have that they want to launch, but they feel like they can't launch. Yeah, it's, it does seem like everyone in industry is just really asking for clarity. That's what they want. They're, they they want to tell me the rules so I can follow them. Um, and I, I think uh, you and Gary discussed this two years ago a little bit. And um, sort of his perspective was that, well, there are rules. The, the rules are there. And <laughs> you still you have to follow those rules. Um, so it'll be, it'll be very interesting to see. Uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens over the next few years. Uh, I want to I want to pull out one little part of that that you said about the in, in, that you're considering in the safe harbor rules, which is about a network being sufficiently decentralized. Um, you know, of course, uh, you know, as a computer scientist, I have some thoughts on what that means, but I don't even know that I'm I'm able to really put a put a finger on it. Um, and I, I'm curious how 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 you and other regulators are thinking about this term and what it means and um, how you know how are we going to use it to to properly regulate. I mean, that's the big question, and it's one that I think has, has, has stymied a lot of people. So the staff at the SEC put out a guidance document that had some factors people could take into consideration for, for whether something's decentralized, but that was a really lengthy list without any suggestion of how you weight the different factors. And so um, I think we have to take a step back and say, all right, what is it we're trying to address here? And the, and the purpose of applying the securities laws for people who, who want to apply the securities laws to all of these transactions is they're trying to address the information asymmetry. So the, the development team has a lot of information and people who are purchasing those tokens probably want to know that information. What are your plans for the project? Um, what are you planning to do? Who, who's the development team behind it? Um, how many tokens are there going to be out there? Those kinds of things. And so the, the real question you're trying to get at with decentralization is when is that development team not critical to the ongoing success of the project? When could that development team walk away and it wouldn't matter? And so I think that the types of things we're looking for are, are indicia of a separation between the development team and the network. The network is kind of on its own and, and functioning on its own. I mean, those are tricky questions. And so I think even in a in a, a reissued safe harbor, I'm not gonna have a, a, a beautiful roadmap to assess what decentralized means, though I'm certainly gonna welcome input. If you think that something like that can actually be created, if I could come up with a top 10 list of what people need to think about, I'm certainly open to it, but so far the people I've talked to have all said, yeah, it's kind of a difficult thing to to assess. So we're still working on that. Yeah, unfortunately, it seems kind of like one of those, you know, when you see it things, which is which is very hard to to deal with in, in, in regulation, certainly. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it seems to me if there is a developer team that that gets to raise the money and gets to make these decisions and gets to go petition the SEC, it's probably not decentralized. The fact that those things exist, um, you know, it, it it might take quite a while to to get from that point to something where it's where it's not. Um, so so um, you know, more on that. You mentioned you'll you'll bring um, your safe harbor uh, proposal to the SEC to the to the new chairman. Um, what are possible directions that you see for the SEC under the Biden administration? Uh, yeah, what do you think is going to happen um, besides, of course, bringing your proposal to the to the floor? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think when a new chairman comes in, he's dealing with a whole array of issues. You know, getting his arms around leading a, a large team of people. Um, you know, about five thousand people, and they're have been a lot of events happening, you know, including COVID, but also the, the GameStop trading events. And so there are a lot of things on the plate of anyone coming into the agency. Um, crypto is one of those things, but it's, it's one of many. So I think what I'm hoping that we'll see in this, um, in this administration is that we'll see a willingness to, to take the calls for clarity seriously um, and to really engage with the community to provide some regulatory clarity. As you said earlier, it's not that people are saying, please don't regulate us. Most people who I've talked to have said, 
could you just tell us what the rules are so that we can operate within them? Yes, they'd like to have some amount of freedom to experiment. And I think that is really important in this space. And that's something that, that I will continue to argue for. Um, but clarity is the, is the principal thing. And so that's what I'm hoping for. I think there are a number of areas where that clarity could be provided. I talked about token distribution events, but people are looking for clarity on things like custody. Um, a lot of institutions now, traditional financial institutions, the legacy financial system is pretty eager to engage with um, Bitcoin especially, but I think Ethereum as well and, and, and DeFi more broadly. Um, and so what can we do to give them comfort that they are able to experiment and to, to, to put a toe into this, into this interesting new um, pool? Yeah, 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 no, definitely. Um, it, it it's important for for people and and institutions and and companies and startups and everyone to be able to I think access it and experiment it with it and innovate inside of it. That's that's what we want to happen. Um, you know, as as you were talking about it, I realized how hard it is to write specific guidelines and clarity on a technology that is changing so fast. And maybe what's so hard about this is the fact that. Um, you know, you don't want to make them so specific that they're out of date in six months. You really need to sit back and, and distill the principles. Um, and we, we're the technology is so new that it's hard to distill the principles. Maybe, um, I don't know if you would agree with this, but I think of sort of the set of regulation we have now as, as sort of focusing on the intermediary. The intermediary is going to kind of keep lists and check on things and keep information and, uh, and, and, that went away <laughs> in this new world. And so so you have to distill a new set of principles. Yeah, no, I think you've exactly captured it right. It, it's this, I have a real fear of building technology into regulation because then it becomes outdated so quickly. In fact, I'm still struggling on a lot of other fronts other than crypto to rip out of our regulatory uh, out of our rule book, the, the old, very old technologies like telegrams and things like that. And so you realize that it, that if you build those old things in, they really stick around. I mean, even we have a very paper-based approach to regulation. There's some requirements that people file things in triplicate. And I'm thinking, who does that anymore? That's, that's the most ridiculous thing. So can we build this framework within which people can have a principle to which they're they're toward which they're aiming, but not specifics that would would lock in old technology. Um, and your point about the intermediary being gone is such a challenge for us because as regulators, we've always had this comfort that we could go to this to this institution in the middle that would um, allow us to address something if something had gone wrong. Um, now, if you have peer to peer transactions. And they're transactions that are immutable. Then how do you how do you address problems when they arise? That is a real challenge for regulators. And one thing we have to guard against is the maybe the inclination on part of regulators to say, all right, well, if we don't have an intermediary, we're going to regulate every peer to peer transaction just the way we would um, if if two regulated financial institutions were interacting with each other. That has profound implications for individual liberty. And I think we really need to uh, be careful to go down that road. Yes, I think I think that's really important. And uh, maybe we could we could uh, talk about, you know, I'd like to sort of think about the international landscape. Um, I don't know how much you you can speak about that, but um, are there any countries out there that you think are doing this? particularly well. Uh, you look at that and you say, hey, we we have something to learn from them. I think they're starting to go down the right path. Well, I think Singapore has taken a, a very um, forward-looking approach. Switzerland, um, even the EU now is trying to, you know, do a better job at, at putting some regulatory clarity in this space. And I think France um, has, has done something similar to my safe harbor. Um, so I think there are a lot of different people trying different things and, and a lot of countries moving faster. I always like to point to, to our states here in the U.S. I think uh, Wyoming has been very much a forward-thinking jurisdiction, so we have something to learn from them. Um, and then even a, a city like Miami, who's saying, you know what, we, we see promise in this technology and we're going to make an effort to make ourselves as friendly as possible, as open as possible to this new technology. 
we have something to learn from them as well. And there's a lot of cooperation going on internationally. I'm, I, I think one of the benefits of being in international organizations is that you have a chance to learn from what others are doing. So we're all kind of learning together in, in, in this space. And I think we all have some learning to do. Uh, so uh, I'd like to, you know, take a question from the audience, if that's okay with you. Um, uh, I think this is a particularly good one. Uh, what would your advice be to entrepreneurs who would like to get into the fast-growing DeFi space, but they want to not be subject to too much legal risk? Well, I, you know, I, I hate to give the advice that you should talk to a lawyer, but it's probably a wise thing to do, especially if you don't have a, a background in securities law yourself. It is it is wise to get some input. You can come and talk to the SEC, and I do recommend that you do if you think there's some kind of connection to securities laws. We have uh, an office, the FinHub, which has now been elevated so that the head of that office, who I think you'll be hearing from later today, Val Stepanek, she reports directly to the chairman. And, you know, it, that is a, it's an office that is staffed with people who really do think about fintech all day long. They understand the, the technology. They also understand the legal backdrop. And so going to talk to them and kind of getting a sense of what some of the, the issues you might be thinking about or should be thinking about, that's a good way to, to start. Um, but I will warn you that, and I think Neha, you mentioned this at the beginning, the wheels of regulatory agencies move so slowly. And so those interactions can sometimes be a bit frustrating because they take a long time. And with technology moving so fast, um, getting into the regulatory swing of things, which is very slow, can be extremely frustrating. I do urge people to come talk to me as well if you're running into, um, if you're running into trouble in terms of getting something to move forward get or just getting answers. Um, I can't guarantee you you'll get the answer you want, but I can try to help that answer come more quickly. I haven't always been successful at that, but it is helpful for me to know that you're having those conversations. I'm sure people here will will really be happy to hear that, though I hope you're not inviting a deluge onto yourself and, and Valerie's, uh, Valerie's desk as well. There's uh, so much going on. Um, the, there's another audience question, which I'm going to ask. I'm going to imagine that you're not going to be able to answer it, but I will ask it anyway because it's so it's so interesting. But um, uh, the question was about was about well, maybe you can answer this part of it. What are your thoughts on the possibility of cryptocurrency switching from a security to a token over time? And the the second sort of part of that question was that the SEC says that XRP is a security. Um, but the complaint uh, and, and Hinman's comments indicate that it's possible for things to switch. So may, I, I, maybe you can, you can take the part of that question that you feel you can answer. Yeah. Yeah, so I can't talk about any ongoing mitigation, but I do think this is an area where the lack of precision by the SEC has been a bit problematic because ultimately it isn't the token itself that is, is the security, it really is the way you sell the token, the offering that gets regulated under the securities laws. But once you've done that, once you've made an offering and you're, you're treating that, that um, offering as a securities offering, it becomes really difficult to parse out how the token can then move around um, in transactions that are not securities transactions. And so that's why there's been this, this effort to look at when does something flip from being a security to a non-security. And that's kind of the, the, the dance I'm trying to dance with my safe harbor. Um, but I, I certainly think that something can transform to being sold from being sold as a security to being transaction, transacted in a way that's not a securities transaction. But that ties back to this decentralization point, or if the token is a functional token, in a network, then I don't think anyone is going to be thinking about that as a, as a security. But I mean, these are difficult questions, and that's why I think everyone, um, including myself, probably needs to speak with a little bit more precision on the point. And uh, it's it's something that I'm trying to work on. I think that's fair. It's a very good answer. Um, you know, I'm curious what you think the risks are both with moving too slowly and with moving too fast. <laughs> so uh, we've talked a little bit about this, but I, I imagine, you know, um, 
a risk with not gaining regulatory clarity is I hear a lot of people mention U.S. competitiveness. I'm, I don't know if that's it or if there's more that you're sort of thinking about as you balance these two things. Yeah, I think U.S. competitiveness is a big part of it. But I also just what I hate to see is the frustration of people who are trying to build things and, and feel like they can't without putting putting themselves at risk of a, of a later enforcement action. So I think the, the risk of moving too fast is that you embed technology in the regulations. The risk of moving too slowly is that you really discourage people. Um, I think we often see a lot of the most, innova the, the most innovative sectors being ones where there's not really an intense regulatory structure. And finance has been one that's really pretty heavily regulated. And that has me meant that it's harder for people new entrants um, or even incumbents to, to experiment with new things. And that's something that really troubles me a lot because finance is, is so key to the rest of the economy. And that's why I do find what's happening in the DeFi space pretty exciting because people are trying to build things kind of from ground up um, and trying trying to do things in a way that, that um, allows everyone to participate in the system and it maybe addresses some of the challenges that, that we face in our centralized financial system. Um, but it, the balance is difficult, especially in a heavily regulated industry like, like finance. Yeah, I was quite shocked um, coming at it fresh and coming from sort of, I guess, more the information world rather than the finance world to see the the difference <laughs> in, in how things were expected to be conducted. Whereas, you know, when we were developing, well, we, when, <laughs> when, the internet was being developed uh, in, in you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s, I think it really benefited from the fact that it, there was a little bit of, a, there was a lighter regulatory touch there. There was, there was more of a, okay, we're not going to get too involved in this and, and we're going to see where it goes um, first. And, and it certainly benefited from that quite a bit. And, and that was really important. It also led to some of the issues we're dealing with today <laughs> around privacy and data ownership and, and things like that. So um, I think, uh, yeah, I'm curious to think if, if you if you ever look at those two worlds and try to try to draw lessons uh, from uh, the internet. Well, yeah, I, mean, I do, and I think I think that we tend to look at finance and we say, oh wow, people can really get hurt in this part of their lives, and so we've got to be very protective of them and in this part of their lives. And I and I I'm, I do care about that aspect, and I think it's something we have to take seriously, um, but we're better off in allowing more participation from more people in this industry because if you get a really if you get a really uh, concentrated industry without a lot of competition actually the one who ends up getting hurt the most is the investor um, and so i think keeping the competition open is really important and yes there are some things on the on the uh, internet side where you think oh you know there are all these problems that we're talking about as a society now about data protection privacy um, centralization of, you know, controlling information that people get access to. Um, but I think a lot of those things can be addressed through some of the new technologies we're talking about at this conference as well. So um, the, I always find that the first place you should look for solutions is the market. You do need to have that regulatory framework in place, but don't underestimate the power of the market, the power of individual creativity to solve some of society's biggest problems. And I think that is a great place to end our conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Purse, for joining us again. Um, we'll hopefully see you in a, in a year or two again and, uh, and, and at the, at this time live and in person. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for having me.